you're under arrest. The house fell in red coals and black ash. It bedded itself down in sleepy pink-gray cinders, and a smoke plume blew over it, rising and waving slowly back and forth in the sky. It was 3.30 in the morning. The crowd drew back into the houses. The great tents of the circus had slumped into charcoal and rubble, and the show was well over. Montag stood with the flamethrower in his limp hands, great islands of perspiration drenching his armpits, his face smeared with soot. The other firemen waited behind him in the darkness, their faces illumined faintly by the smoldering foundation. Montag started to speak twice, and then finally managed to put his thought together. Was it my wife turned in the alarm? Beatty nodded. But her friends turned in an alarm earlier that I let ride. One way or the other, you'd have got it. It was pretty silly, quoting poetry around free and easy like that. It was the act of a silly damn snob. Give a man a few lines of verse and he thinks he's the lord of all creation. You think you can walk on water with your books? Well, the world can get by just fine without them. Look where they got you, in slime up to your lip. If I stir the slime with my little finger, you'll drown. Montag could not move. A great earthquake had come with fire and leveled the house, and Mildred was under there somewhere and his entire life under there, and he could not move. The earthquake was still shaking and falling and shivering inside him, and he stood there, his knees half bent under the great load of tiredness and bewilderment and outrage, letting Beatty hit him without raising a hand. Montag, you idiot. Montag, you damn fool. Why did you really do it? Montag did not hear. He was far away. He was running with his mind. He was gone, leaving this dead, soot-covered body to sway in front of another raving fool. Montag, get out of there, said Faber. Montag listened. Beatty struck him a blow on the head that sent him reeling back. The green bullet in which Faber's voice whispered and cried fell to the sidewalk. Beatty snatched it up, grinning. He held it half in, half out of his ear. Montag heard the distant voice calling, Montag, you all right? Beatty switched the green bullet off and thrust it in his pocket. Well, so there's more here than I thought. I saw you tilt your head listening. First I thought you had a seashell. But when you turned clever later, I wondered, we'll trace this and drop it on your friend. No, said Montag. He twitched the safety catch on the flamethrower. Beatty glanced instantly at Montag's fingers, and his eyes widened the faintest bit. Montag saw the surprise there, and himself glanced to his hands to see what new thing they had done. Thinking back later, he could never decide whether the hands or Beatty's reaction to the hands gave him the final push toward murder. The last rolling thunder of the avalanche stoned down about his ears, not touching him. Beatty grinned his most charming grin. Well, that's one way to get an audience. Hold a gun on a man and force him to listen to your speech. Speech away. What'll it be this time? Why don't you belt Shakespeare at me, you fumbling snob? There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass me as an idle wind, which I respect not. How's that? Go ahead now. You second-hand literateur, pull the trigger. He took one step toward Montag. Montag only said, We never burned right. Hand it over, guy, said Beatty with a fixed smile. And then he was a shrieking blaze, a jumping, sprawling, gibbering mannequin, no longer human or known, all writhing flame on the lawn as Montag shot one continuous pulse of liquid fire on him. There was a hiss, like a great mouthful of spittle banging a red-hot stove, a bubbling and frothing, as if salt had been poured over a monstrous black snail to cause a terrible liquefaction and a boiling over of yellow foam. Montag shut his eyes, shouted, shouted, and fought to get his hands at his ears to clamp and to cut away the sound. Beatty flopped over and over and over, and at last twisted in on himself like a charred wax doll and lay silent. The other two firemen did not move. 
Montag kept his sickness down long enough to aim the flamethrower. Turn around. They turned, their faces blanched meat, streaming sweat. He beat their heads, knocking off their helmets and bringing them down on themselves. They fell and lay without moving. The blowing of a single autumn leaf. He turned, and the mechanical hound was there. It was half across the lawn, coming from the shadows, moving with such drifting ease that it was like a single solid cloud of black-gray smoke blown at him in silence. It made a single last leap into the air, coming down at Montag from a good three feet over his head, its spidered legs reaching, the procaine needle snapping out its single angry tooth. Montag caught it with a bloom of fire, a single wondrous blossom that curled in petals of yellow and blue and orange about the metal dog, clad it in a new covering as it slammed into Montag and threw him ten feet back against the bowl of a tree, taking the flame gun with him. He felt it scrabble and seize his leg and stab the needle in for a moment, before the fire snapped the hound up in the air, burst its metal bones at the joints, and blew out its interior in a single flushing of red color like a skyrocket fastened to the street. Montag lay watching the dead, alive thing fiddle the air and die. Even now it seemed to want to get back at him and finish the injection, which was now working through the flesh of his leg. He felt all of the mingled relief and horror at having pulled back only in time to have just his knee slammed by the fender of a car hurtling by at ninety miles an hour. He was afraid to get up, afraid he might not be able to gain his feet at all with an anesthetized leg. A numbness in a numbness hollowed into a numbness. And now? The street empty, the house burnt like an ancient bit of stage scenery, the other homes dark, the hound here, Beatty there, the two other firemen another place, and the salamander? He gazed at the immense engine. That would have to go too. Well, he thought, let's see how badly off you are, on your feet now. Easy, easy. There. He stood, and he had only one leg. The other was like a chunk of burnt pine log he was carrying along as a penance for some obscure sin. When he put his weight on it, a shower of silver needles gushed up the length of the calf and went off in the knee. He wept. Come on. Come on, you. You can't stay here. A few house lights were going on again down the street. Whether from the incidents just passed or because of the abnormal silence following the fight, Montag did not know. He hobbled around the ruins, seizing at his bad leg when it lagged, talking and whimpering and shouting directions at it and cursing it and pleading with it to work for him now when it was vital. He heard a number of people crying out in the darkness and shouting. He reached the backyard and the alley. Beatty, he thought, you're not a problem now. You always said don't face a problem, burn it. Well, now I've done both. Goodbye, Captain. And he stumbled along the alley in the dark.